Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for Earthquake Preparedness, Shake, Rattle, and Roll with um, Lisa Dedurian. We're going to start in a few minutes after five, probably about four minutes after five o'clock. We have a lot of attendees today and um, we're going to admit them. I want to give you some information so that you have the most optimal zooming time during this program today. So if you could please mute yourself, you can leave your video on if you would like to, or you can turn that off. We are going to record today's program. Thanks very much to Lisa, and it will be on the Pasadena Library's YouTube channel for you to review afterwards and share with your family and friends. We have live transcript, so you are able to activate that yourself on your computer. Lisa is going to be taking chat questions after the program. So if you would please write your chat questions, obviously in chat, and then I will ask them and we'll have an interesting discussion afterwards. Though I'm sure that most of your questions are going to be answered by Lisa's presentation. So while we're, while we're waiting for everyone to join us, I just wanted to point out and give a plug for the Pasadena Star News, the San Gabriel Valley News, and the Whittier News. And this Sunday's newspaper was a whole page, if you can see it, I'm holding it up, all about earthquakes. So it has a lots of valuable information as well if you get the newspaper or you can go to your Pasadena library and ask to see the Pasadena Star News and review the newspaper. So we have some attendees joining us now. I just want to remind everyone, if you could please mute yourself. We're putting questions in chat that Lisa will answer afterwards. Uh, so there is live transcript that you need to activate on your end. And um, today's recording is going, today's program is going to be recorded and put on Pasadena Library's YouTube, YouTube Pasadena Library. So we're absolutely delighted that you are here with us today. So I want to tell you a little bit about our presenter, Lisa Dedarian. She was hired by the city of Pasadena in 2003 as the emergency management coordinator and fire public information officer. Lisa formed the first disaster advisory council comprised of volunteers, which branched out to include community emergency response team courses and a leadership team in addition to implanting a map into your neighborhood program locally. Additionally, Lisa has enhanced disaster preparedness citywide and completed mandated state and federal plans and guidelines to ensure the city is compliant. Lisa has served as the PIO for major incidents, seasonal and safety press conferences and interviews and major special events. In 2018, Lisa was promoted to the City of Pasadena PIO and still remains emergency management responsibilities in addition to being the PIO. Lisa's lived in Pasadena for more than 30 years with her husband, Ron, and enjoys frequent visits from their adult son. In her spare time, if there's any spare time, she works, but she also enjoys physical activity to work off work. Prior to working for the city, Lisa spent seven years as the Director of Communications and Marketing for the San Gabriel Valley American Red Cross. So that you can see how very important Lisa is to Pasadena and how we are just so delighted to be able to welcome Lisa today to present this very important, timely program on earthquakes safety. Thank you very much, Lisa, and welcome. Thank you. Quite an introduction. I greatly appreciate that. And I think tonight is a first. I've never competed with time uh, with the Dodgers. I'm wearing my Dodger blue and hopefully 
the game tonight doesn't turn into a disaster. So uh, I appreciate you all being here to listen to this. I'm, a, I'm an in-person presenter typically, so virtual, be patient with me. But um, as was discussed, tomorrow is the annual Great Shakeout. And it's been going on for many years now. Uh, it's always the date and the same time. So tomorrow's 1021, October 21st at 1021 AM. We want everybody at a minimum to drop cover and hold on for at least a minute to practice what to do in an earthquake. As we all know, for the last two years, everything has been COVID um, and rightfully so. It's preparedness, it's response, and then hopefully soon we'll be recovering from this pandemic. But we forget about the other disasters that can also occur. We are well overdue for an earthquake. Uh, we've seen fires, we've seen floods. I mean, Mother Nature is having a midlife crisis. So am I, but that's another programming topic for another time. Um, but it's important that we prepare for all hazards. Um, we all know that um, recently the Central Library was identified as vulnerable to an earthquake and was closed pending seismic upgrades. So more to follow on that, but our city is diligent about identifying uh, soft story buildings. We've done a lot of work in the past several years. Uh, getting the library up in the next several years up and running is going to be a priority for us because it's a valuable asset. You are all on this um, presentation now because you have a connection to the library. So that's something that is a priority for us. But I'm going to go through uh, a presentation that I typically do, and then we'll do questions at the end. Um, again, with COVID, disaster preparedness is very difficult because prior to that, we tell people get to know your neighbors, know the resources they have, uh, know if what age the kids are, if they come home and they uh, are waiting for their parents to come home, if they have pets that may be alone. But now with COVID, it's stay away from your neighbors. Don't communicate people. Don't touch anything. So it's it's a different um, degree that we're going to be in for probably the next couple of years until we're out of this pandemic to where we can get back to where we were. So we have to adjust accordingly. Even shelters now. Uh, we had a fire last year in a neighboring jurisdiction, and we would typically open up a shelter. But with COVID, what we did is we asked people, get in your vehicles. You're going to evacuate to a nearby tiered parking structure. We will have representatives come get your information, and we will either put you in a motel or hotel setting with vouchers for food and for clothing if needed, but we don't do the typical sheltering as we did before. So we need to adjust based on you know the current incident at hand, which is COVID. Well, my first question to you tonight is, what is going to be more valuable to you after a disaster? My uh, credit card, Platinum, American Express card, or my roll of toilet paper? Hopefully the answer is the roll of toilet paper. And we all learned that um, after and during COVID because you couldn't buy toilet paper um, anywhere. But the reason I asked that pre-COVID is because credit cards run off of electricity, right? We lose power due to a disaster. You're not going to be able to use that credit card. And we live in a day and age of credit cards, Apple Pay, um, you know, not too long ago, I took my kid to breakfast, he's 27 years old, the big spender said, I'll take care of this, he puts his phone up to something, and I'm like, I have no clue what he's doing, it beeps, and he said, I just took care of breakfast, so I'm learning day to day with this technology, but in a disaster, you got to go old school, we'll talk more about, you know, having cash on hand for situations like that. Um, I'm going to give you some homework for tonight, after the Dodger game and after your dinner, I want you to walk around your house, your apartment, condos, wherever you live, start thinking about things you need to be prepared for when we have a large earthquake. Um, it can be uh, things such as the extra cash we talked about. Here's my example, the extra cash. Cash because you may need to run down to a 7-Eleven, um, your market at the corner and if they don't have power or electricity you may have to go old school to where you pay cash they'll hand write you a receipt to come back and get your change okay so where do i where's the number one place i want you to keep your cash at home refrigerator freezer don't say cold hard cash because i've heard that many times why your refrigerator freezer because if you have a fire in your house apartment condo 
uh, the last thing to burn will be your refrigerator or freezer. Then I have people that tell me, I tell too many people where to put their cash. Bad people are going to go in and take it out of your refrigerator or your freezer. So I don't talk to any bad people. I'm not worried about that. But I had a lady not too long ago that took her cash, stuffed it in a chicken so that it would be safe that nobody would find it. So you can be as creative as you want, but put your cash in a baggie, store it in a refrigerator, freezer, small denomination. So if you need that after a disaster, okay? And every time you go to market too, think of things disaster preparedness related. So it doesn't have to be expensive because you're buying bits and pieces every time you go. So, you know, batteries one time, extra canned goods another time. With me, it's beer and chocolate. Uh, but for you, please start with the basics before you advance to my level. Um, ATMs run off of electricity, right? So those will not work during a disaster. So again, having that cash available. Gasoline runs off, the gas pumps run off electricity. So if you're a pessimist, have your gas tank half empty. If you're an optimist, half full, but always have at least half a tank of gas in your vehicle. Now we got the... Um, the electric vehicles now, the hybrid vehicles. So again, ensure that they're charged in case you don't have that ability and you need to evacuate or go somewhere. Don't store a lot of gas in your house or your garage. I have people that tell me they're covered. They got a lot if they need to use it because if you have a fire and, and your garage uh, ignites, your neighbors aren't gonna be real happy when the whole block goes up because you were storing the gasoline. So don't do that. Um, Telephones. After Northridge earthquake, I picked up my phone at home, uh, my landline phone, and it was dead. A representative from the phone company told me several months later that all the phones get knocked off the hook with shaking. And gradually people start putting them back on the hook. Slowly the system gets up and running. So if you still have a landline, which a lot of people do not have, but if you still have one, after an earthquake, ensure the other phones are on the hook, pick up a phone, hang in there, don't hang up, and you will eventually get a dial tone. Cell phones, those are great. Day-to-day, uh, -day, as we know, well, we'll pre-COVID, I think, and now traffic is returning, but people are on their cell phones just to buy time as they're driving in traffic. So sometimes that system gets overwhelmed. And the wildland fires we had last year up north, cell towers burned down. So there was no communication if all you had was a cell phone. So that's where we want to reiterate having those reunification and family plans because we're so, um, we rely so much on our cell phones, but if you don't have a way to charge it because you don't have power at home, you don't have those chargers that you can plug into your cigarette lighters in your car or another means to charge your phone because that will more than likely be your only means of communications. Garage door openers. So many of you have garage door openers whether it be shared in an apartment or condo complex or a private one at home. Um, when I worked for the Red Cross several years ago, I was told that if you lose power at home, you need to get your vehicle out, pull the red cord. So I thought I better practice what I preach. I get home, I'm pulling the red cord, pulling the red cord. My husband's like, what are you doing? I'm like, the garage door isn't open. He goes, no, then you have to manually open it after you pull the red cord. So Practice those things, ensure that if you're not capable of doing that, that you have others that can help you because you may need to get your vehicle out of the garage. Um, other things I want you to have on hand, canned goods. So you can get the ones with the pop-up lids. The shelf life is not as long, but it's a lot easier than having a manual can opener and try to figure that out. I bought one that came in a disaster kit, which I'll show you shortly. And it was like the two prong, you can get carpal tunnel syndrome by the time you try to open up this can. So ensure that if you get, or when you get, I should say, your manual can openers that you practice, you make sure you're comfortable using them because that may be your only means of hydrating or getting nourishment. Um, and don't forget your pets too, for food, for hydration. Uh, when I worked for Red Cross, we taught mouth to snout CPR. And I'd go to these classes and maybe 10 out of 30 people, um, when I asked who was taking adult, child, and infant CPR, 10 out of 30 people would raise their hands. People value their pets more than their loved ones, their friends. So ensure that your pets are taken care of too with the extra food and supplies. Um, what I want you to have next to your bed here. All right, when you do your homework, next to your bed, 
uh, not next to your bed where you're going to get out in the middle of the night and trip and fall. Not, I'm going to be in big trouble if you have to call 911. But tuck uh, like the toe of the shoe between the mattress and the box spring or put it slightly under your bed. But next to your bed, I want you to have your shoes. In one shoe, I want you to have gloves. So when we have shaking, an earthquake in the middle of the night, you can get up, safely remove any fallen debris or glass without cutting your fingers. And in the other shoe, not socks, everyone always says socks, forget about hygiene during a disaster, but put a flashlight. So you know where your flashlight is or a headlamp so you're hands free and you can have the headlamp. Okay. If we have shaking in the middle of the night, the first thing I want you to do is gently put a pillow over your face. I would never tell my husband that it may never come off. But uh, that way, if you have any debris falling from above um, or anything that can harm you, lamps or anything that can shake and, and fall, you want to ensure you're at least protecting your face. Wait till the shaking stops and then get up and do the assessment once you put on your shoes, your gloves, and you have your flashlight. Okay, so those things are very important. Um, a few other things I want you to wear before we go through the disaster kit. Uh, pay phones. You're thinking no one uses pay phones anymore. I don't know if they have any in some of the libraries um, adjacent to or the parks, but pay phones work off an older underground system. So as you're out and about uh, during the course of your day, try to look for the pay phones. If they're not graffitied or vandalized or whatever, um, and they're still there, they will more than likely work, whereas your cell phone or landline phone may not during a disaster. Okay. Um, cell phones. Different providers may be up and running, whereas others may not. But if you call 911 from a cell phone, if you are close to a freeway, it will more than likely go to the highway patrol. If you're, you know, within a half mile more away from it, you will hopefully go to your local police department so you can call for help. Now, what I want to make sure you have in your phones, and I know the newer phones have it um, to where you can program it in there, but it's ice in case of emergency. So we have a, an earthquake, any other type of emergency, uh, you pass out or you're not able to communicate, our paramedics are trained to look in your phones. If it's password protected, it won't work necessarily, but sometimes in the iPhones, you can bypass that. But to look who you have under your ICE contact. So uh, for me, I have my husband, I have my son, who the paramedics will call and say, you know, Lisa just had an emergency. Here's where we're transporting her. But keep that information current. I share the story with my counterpart in Glendale said, you know, hey, Mrs. Jones, uh, Mr. Jones was injured in a car accident. He said, I could care less if she drops that I divorced her five years ago. So make sure you keep that information current for your ICE contacts. Otherwise, you know, important to have your information. Don't put it on your refrigerator. A lot of people do that too. They'll put in case emergency contact, they'll, they'll put way too much information on a refrigerator, you know, with the magnets outside there with pictures and stuff. But we have had very few, but we have had situations where people come in, they can easily take a snapshot of that on their phones and they use it for negative reasons. So uh, you can put something on your refrigerator saying emergency information inside and in like an index card, write on it the medication you're on. And keep it current because those, those things change. Uh, any medical conditions that you have, uh, emergency contact, put it like in a baggie and hang it in your refrigerator. So if you need help, paramedics show up, at least we have some background information on you that will help expedite your care. Okay. Um, and then the, um, what do you call it? The solar lights that you have in front of your house. We had a power outage not too long ago. We're in Pasadena, so we have a great utility. So uh, that does not happen often, but it was a short power outage. Uh, and I discovered my flashlights, the batteries were dead, and here I am not practicing what I preach, but I walk outside and the solar lights that I have in front of my house, there's probably six of them, uh, were up and running. So I grabbed those, pulled them in the house, realized they had like 30 worms on each one, but that's another story. But you know, use these resources you don't think about that you may have, such as solar lights for the exterior that you can bring inside if need be. All right, so we're going to go through the disaster items here, and I apologize if I turn my head briefly, but I want to make sure that you see them. So uh, doggy bones, okay? I don't have a dog. If one of you want to take my husband, I can get a dog. But um, so why do I have doggy bones in my kit? Well, I live next door to the little lady of Pasadena, right? So 
when we have an earthquake, if she needs help, she's got a big dog and I'm not, you know, going to try to go up against that dog. So if I can at least throw bone in a corner or get this dog confined to a certain area, then we can provide care and help uh, my neighbor. So although you may not have pets, they come in handy. Cuddly items, okay. Um, children revert back to their childhood, infancy, um, sounds like an oxymoron, but uh, they get scared during a disaster, especially earthquakes, because earthquakes are not tangible. They're not in your face every day. We don't practice enough. So when shaking starts, kids get very nervous. So have like cuddly items, items that they um, that will comfort them, okay? Uh, when my kid was in elementary school, he had his earthquake kit, and I put a picture of the family, and I put a little note, mommy and daddy will come get you soon. I was just joking because we're both in public safety. He'd be stuck there for a while. But my point being, it would at least comfort him for a little bit. So comfort items. And for pets too. Again, don't forget pets. If they have a favorite toy, something to calm them down if you need to. Okay, so my pre-made kit that was very expensive came with six pack of water. Okay, these are like those little sippy cups. Three sips, you're done. Uh, it got smushed. That's my technical word tonight, smushed. So they, they would do me no good. So don't, I mean, you can, but don't go out and buy these expensive kits, fall for the false marketing of, you know, disaster water um, supplement, because this is not going to do you much good. And same thing with the first aid kit. The marketing on the disaster um, kit said, oh, it comes with a first aid kit. This is like three Band-Aids, a little thing of ointment. Wouldn't help an ingrown toenail if I had one. So make sure, again, you supplement and you don't fall for the marketing. You can go to the Targets, the Walmarts, the Costcos, and uh, even your, your general CVS store has travel sections typically where you can get a lot of items, very reasonably priced, put them in an old backpack, and make your own kits. Now, this is the blue can. This is a 50-year uh, shelf life water. It's all natural. It's very good. You put it away. You don't need to worry about it. I have a case and in my trust fund uh, or my trust account, I have, I'm going to leave it to my son because uh, it'll last a lot longer than I will. Uh, this is 50 years. It's about a dollar a can. So people are like, that's way too expensive. But these are the same people I'm in line with at Starbucks that spend $3.50 on a cafe latte, double shot, whatever, uh, several times a week. So when you put it in perspective, uh, definitely worth doing. That. Medication. You probably think I should be on more than I am. But, uh, medication with insurance the way it is, it's hard to say uh, to your physician, I need you know weeks uh, worth of medication because when there's a disaster I may not be able to get to the pharmacy uh, that typically won't work very well so again don't wait till you're down to um, your final few doses make sure that you uh, refill accordingly so that you have some extra on hand if you can't get to a pharmacy cameras I show this to my kid he's like what is film like film um don't necessarily get rid of your cameras. Yes, we all have phones these days. You can take pictures, uh, which is great. Uses a lot of juice for your phone. So you're going to go through your battery a lot quicker. But hold on to your old cameras. Document, document, document. So just personally, I had flooding at my house a couple months ago. And the first thing the insurance company says, can you document uh, where this was before it was damaged? Can you take pictures or do you have pictures of whatever was damaged? And we did it, so my bad. So whether it be for a criminal situation where something can happen um, or a disaster situation, take pictures now to show after uh, what the damage is. And in the courses that we teach, which I'll go over shortly, uh, one of them is map your neighborhood and you assign somebody on your block that would go take pictures of damage because you may be told to evacuate your neighborhood. And when you come back, if there's aftershocks or anything, you want to ensure that you have uh, the photos for, for insurance and for personal reasons to make sure that that's all documented. Uh, maxi pad. So maxi pad, I, when I worked for the fire department, I came up on a traffic accident one time and a guy had a huge cut on his arm. He had a maxi pad on it and there was tape around it uh, to keep it secure. 
And I thought, what a novel concept. This will do what 20 Band-Aids won't do, right? Plus you can swim and hike and, I'm just kidding. Um, so, um, you know, whether it's this, whether it's, uh, you know, I heard somebody say they're in the military, oh, you can use tampons for, um, you know, deep cuts or for gunshot wounds. Hopefully we don't need to deal with that, but another thought. Um, or depends, you know, depending on what stage of life you're on, it could be maxi pads, depends. Um, but as a result of that, I have these in my glove compartment now. It's a little embarrassing when people open up the glove compartment looking for spare change and all these fall out. But this will do, like I said, what Band-Aids won't do, and it helps. So I, I told the senior center at a presentation recently, I was speaking with probably 30 seniors, and I was telling them about this, and a lady called me a couple weeks later and told me that uh, it, it works and depends. I'm like, depends on what? She goes, depends. I'm like, I, depends on what? Then I understood what she was trying to tell me, that her husband fell, cut his head open, heads bleed heavily. So she went, got the depends, put it on his head, and that helped stop the bleeding till the paramedics arrive. Of course, I never lived that down with the paramedics. I keep hearing about it to this day, but it does a trick. So you got to do what you got to do. Uh, so these glow sticks, these are popular now with Halloween approaching. These are about a dollar a piece. You can get them at the, um, like the 99 cent store, Party City. Uh, you crack them and they provide pretty good light. So these are also a good alternative if you don't have a lot of flashlights. Take one of these, crack it open during the windstorms. In 2011, I lost power for quite a while at home. I open up one of these and then if you put it in the freezer, it helps keep the shelf life longer too. So now in your freezer, you're going to have your cash batteries. If you keep in the freezer, it will extend the shelf life. Light sticks. So there's not much room for my ice cream anymore. But my point is, uh, little tricks. If you do crack this open and the power comes on, put it in the freezer because you may lose power again. Here is the phone charger I mentioned. So you can buy, uh, they look like the like um, uh, lipstick you know, uh, cases to where they're solar powered and or you charge the unit to power your cell phone after a disaster if you don't have electricity. Those are great, but you got to remember to charge them. So put a reminder in your calendars on your phones or your computer so that you know every so often to charge it. But I just rely on this. I know that I can more than likely get to a vehicle. And if I need to charge my cell phone, I can plug this into um, the cigarette lighter and get some juice. Going. Maps, old school. I still have a Thomas guide. And um, as you know, if you plug in a location on your phone, for Siri or Google, whoever to tell you how to get there, that uses a lot of juice on your phone too. So uh, go old school, make sure you have evacuation routes that you can refer to. Uh, we're creatures of habit. So I know even me, I only have a four or five mile commute each way, but uh, I go the same way every day, home and you know to work and home. So have alternate routes after disaster, um, the 2011 windstorms, an example, streets were impacted by a lot of debris, um, you know, trees in the streets, uh, down power lines. And yes, I was able to get through the city, but if I was somewhere not where I'm familiar, you're going to want to make sure you have a Thomas guide if there's no other way to plug in a route to get home. So go old school with that too. Trash bag. Okay, trash bag for obvious reasons, right? During the windstorms, I said to a guy that was, he was wearing a trash bag, had the arms cut out, it was stuffed with newspaper. And I said, um, you know, are you okay? And the guy said, it's an old military trick that um, you know, cut out the arms, stuff with newspaper and it helps you warm up because we forget we live in sunny, sunny Southern California, but if we lose power, you're not gonna have heat, you're not gonna have air. So you may need to, to keep yourself warm. Do not start lighting candles or turning on your stove or ovens in your house because that could turn into a whole separate disaster with carbon monoxide and or you know, fire hazard with candles. So that's a trick too. Also for trash bags or old pillowcases, if we have a, when we have an earthquake, you're told you need to evacuate, do it now. Don't wait till disaster. Right on the pillowcase or the trash bag things that you want to take with you if you're told you got 10 minutes to get out because in a panic situation you're not going to remember so write on it you know grandma's pictures uh, 
jewelry, uh, your kids vaccination records, whatever the case may be, write it so that you know what to quickly put in trash bags or your pillowcases and go because you don't typically have a lot of boxes around your house that you can load up and put in the car. Trash bags. So your plumbing's impacted by an earthquake, even if it's just the, the initial earthquake and then we have a larger aftershock after, that may send your plumbing out of whack. So you can't use it, but you also uh, need to shelter in place and can't go anywhere. Take a, new, take a trash bag, line your toilet. If you have kitty litter, even better. Um, do what you gotta do because mother nature calls. Take the trash bag, bury it in the backyard and hope the dog doesn't dig it up in a few years but at least you have a means to go to the restroom uh, if your plumbing is impacted. Another little tip I learned too, so we have an earthquake right now, your plumbing is still working. If you have a bathtub or even a sink, fill it up right away. Cause then if we have an aftershock and that impacts your plumbing or we have a larger quake, then at least you have some base of water to use, which is going to be vital. Um, you know, people, we turn on our faucets every day, we get water, we take our showers, our baths, we're in a drought situation, but we all, we know that we have that water if we need it. That's imperative that we think about the hydration. You can survive on just, you know, hydration without nourishment, but you need to make sure you have, <laughs> excuse me, that extra uh, water, one gallon per person per day. We have a lot of people that will fill up big drums with water which is great, you're thinking along those lines, but it's bad because if you have to evacuate, <laughs> sorry, I can drink my water now. Um, sorry, I talked too quick. It's bad if you have to evacuate because you can't move all that water. So smaller bottles, smaller gallons <clears throat> that you're able to transport. Hmm. Hey, this is my gas and water shut off. Do you always turn it off after an earthquake? No. Gas has a very distinct rotten egg smell. Do not turn it off unless you smell that because it may take weeks or months like after Northridge earthquake to get it turned on. So make sure you practice and you know how to do it too. Those valves, if they're not exercised properly, they can stick and they freeze. And so then you're in trouble. But I've also heard stories where people go out and they exercise the valves or they turn it on to make sure they know how to do it or off and it breaks because they haven't used it. <laughs> so if you have uh, the gas company or you have water and power at your house or you can ask them to come out and assess it just to show you how to do it and to make sure that it's okay when you do practice that. Hey, do not put this by your gas meter. I see a lot of people like, oh, it's, I'll put it right there so I know where it is if I need it because this can break windows. This also has um, the mechanism to be able to break a window if need be too. So ensure that you don't keep it somewhere where it's visible to the street. Put it again in a big bag of your bag and maybe uh, put it behind where it's not visible. This is my tool. I have this next to the bed, actually. Um, that's probably why my husband sleeps on the couch. But um, this is good. Uh, it sounds like a joke, but you can get stuck in your own bedroom. So I live in an old ranch style home in Hastings Ranch. We get a lot of shaking and in past earthquakes, just the noise alone uh, freaks me out because that wood flexes and you can hear that. So my door can easily jam. I may have no way to get out of my bedroom. So again, this is something that's good. I can use to try to work my way out if I need to break a window. So there's several uses for this. And in our CERT training that we do, uh, we show you how to use tools like this too and things you may have around the house that will be beneficial um, in a disaster. Um, and then mask. So what is scary is prior to COVID, we always said, oh, make sure you have masks in your um, disaster kits because you get ash and debris during a fire. We've seen a lot of wildland fires where the city is coated with ash. That's terrible to breathe in. So people walk around with masks, right? Um, we could have wind and you want to make sure you protect your breathing. That's why we also recommend goggles or glasses. It's nice that you give your glasses to charity or nonprofit when you have to advance to your next prescription, but it's also good you hold on to it because one of the first things to break during an earthquake are your glasses. They'll fall off a shelf, they'll fall off and you get up and step on them. So 
always you know ensure that you have uh, several pairs i got them all throughout the house if i need them because uh, that's important i know in my situation with my vision now you know i I need to wear my glasses, so I need to ensure I have several pairs all over the place. Um, so let's talk about some training that we offer too. Uh, with COVID, we have not done in-person training. That's why we're doing this virtually too. But through the fire department, we offer community emergency response team training or CERT. We usually do two courses a year, and that's because they're about 21 hours each, require a lot of work. Uh, there's disaster preparedness. There's a search and rescue component, medical, and then fire suppression, because most people have fire extinguishers, but they don't know how to use them. They never read the instructions, went to a fire one time, uh, started in a trash can. The fire extinguisher was in the trash can. We asked why that was, and the guy said, I didn't know what to do with it. I thought if I threw the extinguisher at the fire and put it out, but that doesn't work. So we teach you how to use fire extinguishers. And if you learn anything today too, do not keep a fire extinguisher like in the kitchen by where typically the fire starts. Keep it adjacent to, maybe in your garage next to the kitchen um, so that it's not part of the incident that you can use it to help um, mitigate the incident. So fire extinguisher is very important, ABC, so that you cover, that's the type we want you to get, covers all different types of fires. Uh, but if a fire gets too big too, we want you to get out. Don't try to put that out. Call 911 and wait, you know, for the fire department to get there. But these are things we teach you in that CERT course, which is great. Uh, we just do general disaster preparedness for groups like we're doing right now. Because even if you walk away tonight with just a few gems, then I've done my job and I'm comfortable and confident. But uh, I live in town, like I said, I'll be in sweats and a t-shirt at the market on the weekends and people walk up and they're like, you're that disaster lady. You know, I've been meaning to put my kit together. So the worst word of my vocabulary is the C word complacent. Don't be complacent. The other three are cooking, cleaning and computers. I don't do well either, but don't be complacent. That's my fourth C that I, I get aggravated with. You know, please take action because we all know that we put things off, something happens and it's I should have and I, I you know, could have. So please make it a priority because it, you know, I always tell people look in the mirror because that's all you're going to see or get help from in a large disaster. Our resources will be overwhelmed. Day to day, our fire department is amazing. We have great mutual aid, uh, great response time, but it's the earthquake, the large incident to where our resources will be overwhelmed. We may not be able to get uh, our personnel back into the city if they're off duty because traffic or roads are impacted and it's going to be whoever's in town helping out each other. So vital that uh, you know you get prepared now, please. And the more you practice, the less scared you're gonna be. For those of you with kids, ask what the plans are at the schools because we, we neglect um, to ask and don't be afraid to ask uh, the principal or the teachers, what extra supplies do you have? What are the plans um, for the schools? Uh, in high school situations, kids will just walk off campus, drive home or try to get to where they can. That's a hard age group to try to control. It's the younger ones. We wanna ensure that they have plans in place at the schools because believe it or not, it's not mandated for schools. They don't have to have supplies. Yes, they have to have a plan and many do not. So please make sure you ask those questions because you want to be comfortable if you're at work, can't communicate or can't get to them. You want to know that they're taken care of. Same thing with pets. You know, when you have people drop them off at the daycares now, my sister does that every day, drops her dog off to a daycare that's more expensive than top private school in town. But um, you know, I said to her, ask what happens. You know, you want to ensure that they have extra food and water for the pets if they have to sustain for several days. And then we have a map your neighborhood program, which I briefly mentioned earlier, will come out and help you organize your neighborhood, who has what resources. So uh, librarians are the best. You have such a calm demeanor. Um, same thing with teachers. So if we had to take a group of kids um, so that the parents can help remove debris or rubble from a house, you know, typically librarians, teachers can help with that. Uh, we had somebody that was a photographer on the block that said, I can't do much in a disaster. That's where you use them to help document and take pictures. Uh, retired doctors or nurses. Doctors are, with all due respect, if anybody's a doctor out there, they're not good when they're not in their day-to-day -day environment. So like a, a doctor that works in a hospital situation, 
day after day after day, when you put them then in a different environment, it, it's a whole different beast. So look at what people do for a living, have done for a living, uh, hobbies, uh, amateur radio groups, all those things. Everybody can get an assignment because there's something for everybody out there. But with Map Your Neighborhood, you talk about it ahead of time so that when the disaster strikes, people know their roles and responsibilities and everybody takes action to help each other. So it's all about the help, neighbor helping neighbor. So I know I talked really fast. I hope you listened even quicker. Um, and then I guess we'll turn it over to questions now. Um, and again, I appreciate your time. I, I really uh, thank you for spending time tonight to listen to me. This was a fabulous program, Lisa. I think everyone actually will need to listen to it again and have a pencil and paper and write down everything that you recommended. And we all hope that we actually do more than just, as you said, two or three things, because everything that you presented to us was so invaluable and things that um, we don't think that we can use um, around our home are very useful and things that we um, need to purchase. Um, and I don't know if a lot of people thought about the refrigerator or the freezer. Um, they used to have those Coke cans where you would put things in. So um, maybe we all look for something and get the baggies out and hide them in it. You hope you don't cook the chicken with the money in it, as you said. Right. So, um, so, um, so some of the, as everybody is saying in the chats, excellent presentation, Lisa. Thank you. Do you have a list of those items posted online? Yes, and I should have mentioned um, the city of .net under fire has that list. Um, I will also get you that. Hopefully, we can post it somewhere. Some of the things are things like well, the maxi pads may not be on your typical list. Some of these things are extras that uh, we can add to that list. Uh, but the city website does have that information. The Red Cross has some great sites. Tomorrow with the shakeout, I'm sure through the media, you'll be seeing a lot of great lists out there too. Uh, that'll help you at least with the starter kit, but I'm always available. This is my passion. So I love talking about this and trying to help you too. So please reach out and I'll do whatever I can from my end. Yeah, so we all need to remember tomorrow um, on October the 21st, Thursday at 10.21 a.m. We need to drop cover and hold on. And then we can listen to the news and um, find out more information. Somebody wants to know, what do we do if we're driving? What do you suggest people to do? Because your car is going to shake, right? Right. And I was actually in that situation in the Whittier earthquake. I don't recall what year that was. And I thought I was having car problems. Um, so I pulled over and then turned on the radio and realized that that was, it was a pretty significant earthquake. Um, so stop wherever you are if there's a way to avoid like an overpass although since the northridge earthquake a lot of the freeways have been retrofitted to meet seismic standards but try to pull over um, and that's why we want you to have a disaster backpack in your vehicle too it can have snacks water um, again things to entertain your kids coloring books crayons um, you know nowadays everywhere i am to keep kids quiet for lack of a better term, people get my pads or things that run off electricity. Here, you use my phone, use my pad. So go old school with that too. Coloring books, crayons, board games, that's B-O-A-R-D, board games um, to entertain them. Keep that stuff in your car. But if it's in your car too, it will expire sooner because the weather elements. So water may expire sooner. Taste it and you can tell. If you have snacks, granola, dried cereals, great. Keep those things with you, knowing that if roads are impacted and you're in your vehicle, you may not be able to go very far. Okay, thank you very much for that valuable information. Somebody wants to know, what's more reliable, a landline or a cell phone? I only have a cell phone now. Should I get a landline? Well, I mean, we always recommend the redundancy uh, in having your landline. Uh, again, now you can bundle with a lot of these companies, which is more reasonably priced than it was initially. But I mean, cell phones are good. Everybody has those now, just because of the fact that you need to ensure you have a way to charge it. If, especially if you're in your car, like we just discussed, and you can't get home to charge your phone, you need to make sure you have a way to charge your phone. Um, 
landlines are always good, but, but nothing is 100% reliable. That's why redundancy is perfect. I always preach uh, that amateur radios, those things will work internationally. And that's the one thing that um, I think will always work no matter what type of disaster we have. So I, I always rec recommend going through that course. The radios now have really gone down in price. There's groups out there that uh, do networking and you get your relatives and friends, and coworkers involved. But uh, if you can do both landline and cell phone, great. If not, just ensure that you have the means um, ahead of time to charge your phones and be able to respond accordingly. Okay. Should we have multiple earthquake kits? For instance, one in our home, one at work, and one at the office. Hundred percent. So, home, work, office, as you just mentioned. Again, talk if you have uh, you know kids in school. Um, a lot of ecumenical groups, churches, for example, um, have a cache of supplies too, knowing that people may congregate there after a disaster because they need sheltering, or they may be at church or um, their their uh, religious group when an earthquake hits. So the more you have, and that's why they're expensive. So people avoid doing it. So make your own kits, uh, have a family day where you put everything together and everybody is in, in empowered to have their own kits, young kids, let them do it. So they know what's in it. They understand how to use it and they feel like they put it together. So uh, it makes them feel better knowing that they can um, use it if need be. Okay, so you talked about the water that lasted for 50 years that will right. outlive some of us. Right. So how long, if we, we take a, a gallon of water or we buy a gallon of water from the market, how long will that be fine? So again, a lot of that's marketing where they tell you to replenish it every year because they want the sales. But um, I would recommend in your phones as a calendar reminder every six months or when we, um, like the time change is coming up in a few weeks, that's opportunity to check your batteries and your smoke detectors, carbon monoxide batteries, and check your water. You can take a few sips. It's not going to hurt you if it's bad, but you'll be able to taste it. Um, and if it is not good, use it, water the plants or something uh, to put it to good use and replenish it. Water's cheap. We know that. You can even take those bottles, clean them out, and, and refill it with tap water if you want. So it should have you know three to five year shelf life, except... If it's in a storage shed like I have in my backyard. So again, the weather elements will make it uh, go sour before it typically would, just like any of your other items you may have in your kit. So check them often. Okay, so um, what about a generator? Do you recommend it? And if so, how many watts or how big of a generator do you want? I mean, generators are great. They're expensive too. They have gone down in price in the last couple of years, but uh, they're good to have as long as you know how to use them. You exercise those too, because I know people like during the windstorms, they had purchased generators prior. They never used them, never exercised or practiced um, to make sure they're running properly. And then they were no good when they went to use them. Other people had them, they used them inside the house. And we actually got a call for um, carbon monoxide poisoning because generators are meant to be used on the exterior they're good if you can get the, whatever power needed to to keep your refrigerator freezer going or uh, those that are on critical life-sustaining equipment and that's something else i neglected to mention is don't forget those with access functional needs any disabilities vital that you communicate with your neighbors your coworkers, so that you know what they need how you can help them during and after a disaster and that's where generator is vital too because we don't want that false sense of security that the fire department will get to you because you are on life sustaining equipment because we may not be able to do that so ensuring you have a generator that somebody can help get up and running for you to keep um, the equipment going or just to keep like i said your refrigerator freezer or things that you need right away for several days going Generators, some of them also, uh, you need the gasoline. So again, just be cautious of not storing too much gasoline in your house um, if you have a fire. But always recommended, shop around um, and, and, and ask the salesperson, and sure you go somewhere where you can ask the salesperson to show you how to use it and what you would need it for. Bring you know whatever watts your fridge are free to run off of so that you can um, get a better estimate for what you would need.
So you talked about CERT, C-E-R-T classes. Um, are any of them in these courses coming up? And how do we sign up? Yeah, please get in touch with me. We have an existing list. Um, we don't do it for specific businesses or schools because we only do it twice a year. So we, we have a wait list. Uh, we would love to get you involved. I'm working with the fire department now to try to come up with some dates. We have held them in the past at uh, like Huntington Hospital or um, Church of the Nazarene or Fuller Theological places that can accommodate a larger group. Now with COVID, we want to ensure that we have the space for it. Central Library is a great location for doing trainings because uh, the theater there. So that's something that's really missed that we can't use that facility. But we hope again in the near future, we'll bring that up and, and we can do that. But uh, we hope to have a course in the next few months. Uh, we do CERT overviews. So I want to encourage those of you that live in Pasadena, please contact your council members because pre-COVID, we would do like a, a CERT boot camp, for lack of a better term. We're on a Saturday morning from 8 a.m. to noon. We would do like a taste of CERT. So you got an example of all four modules to entice you then to sign up for the full course. And the council members sponsor them. And I mean that by they would maybe provide refreshments, but we use their mailing list to get it out to the constituents. So I need you please to get in touch with the council members and let them know that you'd like a CERT overview on a Saturday morning because some council members um, we're more proactive than others in doing it, but it, it's great uh, overview for that. Can you um, use this course or teach this course outside so you, we could have a lot of people spaced out adequately um, in a larger area versus our meeting rooms and our branches? Is that a possibility as long as everybody can hear, of course? Yeah, no, definitely. That's definitely a possibility. Um, you know, some of the search and rescue is already outside, the fire extinguisher training. Um, when we do that, though, we do have our fire personnel in close proximity with the residents that they are instructing. So, you know, we can say people need to be wearing masks, whatever the current protocol and best safety and welfare of both the fire representatives and the residents will ensure that we do that. But yes, we can definitely um, you know, be flexible as far as how we present the courses. So after an earthquake and you get up in the middle of the night and you have your gloves and your flashlight in your shoes, right. what should you check then? Should you first of all go out and see where your gas comes into your house? You, should you see where the water main is coming in? Should you go around and see whether there are cracks or whether part of your living room ceiling is falling down? Or is it best really just to stay where you are in your bed because there's probably going to be an aftershock. You're absolutely right. Everyone thinks of the initial quake, but they don't think of the aftershock. So once the shaking stops, uh, people's first reaction is to get up and run. Or if, if they have kids, they want to run in the kids' room or go check on pets. Take a deep breath. Wait till the shaking stops. Put on the shoes, the gloves. If it's the middle of the night and it's dark, uh, that's where I have concerns that you don't know what you're walking into. Priority is, yes, check the kids, ensure they're OK. And that reminds me too, when my kid was young, we had an armoire next to his, um, well, not next to a couple feet from his door, right? And we had somebody come in one time and say, you know, if there's an earthquake, this armoire can move three to four feet and block access into his room. So again, ensure that you do a home hazard assessment, make sure heavy objects are not too close to doors to block them, but walk through your house, um, I recommend not going outside unless you have to, because you could have down power lines. Um, you can have trees that are down. You can have other hazards. So I want to make sure that you don't go out there unless it's, you know, we daylight approaches. Uh, obviously, if you see flames, if you smell gas, that's a different story. Um, people wa automatically want to call their friends and loved ones and see if they're okay, if they felt the shaking, which is good but keep those lines open for emergency responders because the more people on the cell phones, uh, the less people will have the ability to get through when they really need to. So don't call 911 and say, hey, we just had an earthquake. We'll know that. <laughs> we, we really have had that in the past where people call, call 911 and say, hey, I just want to tell you we had an earthquake. We know that we have our plans in place. Uh, we exercise and drill on that uh, on an ongoing basis. So keep those lines open for emergency responders. Um, you know, again, if it's daytime and we have the earthquake, 
make sure your coworkers okay, but try to just um, be methodical in the way that you move about, knowing that there may be hazards out there that you're not looking for, tree limbs, branches that are about to fall and that, that aftershock or secondary earthquake can cause more damage. Okay, thank you very much. Someone's asking about solar generators. Um, it seems to be a newly launched um, thing to get, and they're not very heavy, but they're very expensive, $2,500 to $4,000. Are they valuable or not necessary? You know, I don't know that much about them to really comment too much, but I know like solar power lighting, people will buy that, um, they'll store them in a closet. But in my personal opinion, by the time you take them outside, get the solar energy to get it up and running, we're three days into a disaster. So I'm hoping those generators work quicker than that. Just like the hand cranked flashlights, people buy those. I prefer to use your energy for something other than hand cranking a flashlight to get it up and running in the radio. Go buy flashlights, store them everywhere, they're cheap. But yeah, solar power makes me a little nervous because you have to get that source of energy to get it up and running. But again, I don't know that much about the generators to to recommend or not recommend uh, those. But as far as just generally, you know, if there's another means of getting um, the, the energy going, that's what I would think the easiest route and the quickest route. Well, all of your answers to our many, many questions have been <laughs> absolutely invaluable. And Thank there's you. actually, if, you, if everyone goes to the chat and you go to something that's come in at 547, or there were several before that, you can actually see the HTTPS semicolon two backslashes www.cityofpasadena.net slash fire slash disaster dash preparedness dash what to do um, dash number emergency kit. So you can find everything on the city of Pasadena webpage. And also I recommend everyone to um, re-listen to this program. Share this on um, YouTube Pasadena Library. It contains invaluable information. Um, and we are so fortunate in the city of Pasadena to have someone like Lisa able to guide us for it and give us these classes. Um, it's been absolutely an invaluable afternoon. And I think, as Lisa said, you can contact her at Lisa L. Dedarian at cityofpasadena.net if you think of anything that she hasn't answered, but I can't really think of anything that you might think of. Um, and I encourage you all to re-review this um, video recording of the event. So we, we do have just one more message and then we'll end. Um, so let's, well, we actually have a couple. What should you check after the earthquake, such as gas leaks and cracks? So you, you talked about the smell, don't turn it off. And then you go around in the cracks. I mean, there's not much you can do unless it's, your roof's falling in, and then you get out of the way. Right, and it's, um, if you see cracks, that may be natural after a large earthquake. If you start seeing more infrastructure, bends, um, I mean, you'll be able to tell more than likely if you need to evacuate. Um, you're not going to get the fire department up there in a large earthquake because life safety will be priority. Uh, secondary will then be coming in and um, assessing structural damage. But uh, you should be able to tell if in doubt, get out. Same thing with gas. We talked about the rotten egg smell. But if you have any doubt, the older we get, the less our sense of smell is too. So any doubt, just turn it off, but just know it may be a while to get it turned back on. Well, thank you so much, Lisa, for spending this afternoon with us. Uh, we appreciate all of your time and your knowledge for us and for all of the city of Pasadena. So um, if you have any other questions, write them down, contact Lisa, review this program on YouTube Pasadena Library and go to the city's website or to the American Red Cross and um, we just thank you so, so much. It was very, very helpful. Thank so you so good, much. I appreciate your time. Good night, everyone. Have a good evening. And we'll all go and see now what the Dodgers are up to. And thanks for wearing that blue, Lisa. <laughs> of course. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Good night.